Our next speaker, uh, Sergio Pesca from Stanford University. Presentation is on from cells to assembly, constructing and deconstructing human central nervous system development and disease. Thank well, thank you. you so much. Really delighted to be here and uh, share with you some of our most recent work. In fact, I plan on sharing a couple of stories that are unpublished and would actually be very grateful if, uh, especially for those who are online, who would for not sharing um, or screen sharing some of the data before it actually gets published. Um, one of the big questions in neuroscience is how do ultimately genes lead to, uh, how, how do ultimately genes build a nervous system and how that ultimately yields behavior? And that is particularly uh, um, relevant today as we have very, very long list of genes that are associated with disease. So for instance, you can just see just the top 100 genes associated with autism. And really understanding how those genes uh, lead to essentially behaviorally defined disorders such as autism has been incredibly difficult. Of course, the main challenge and the main barrier in this has been accessing uh, brain tissue. And of course, most of the studies that we've done and most of the knowledge that we have about the nervous system comes from uh, mouse models. But we all, and especially here, I guess, recognize not only that there are unique aspects of the mouse uh, uh, nervous system development that are, um, uh, that are not present in human cells, but also that the context, the genomic context of many of these uh, genetic conditions actually matters a lot. And so the reason uh, why uh, this has been incredibly slow is because to a large extent the human brain is inaccessible. So if you were to just like think about human brain development, you can quickly realize that while we know quite a lot about the early stages of patterning and cell specification, the more you advance in human brain development, the least we know. So for instance, only now we're starting to understand uh, what is some of the cell diversity that underlies parts of the nervous system. So for instance, we now have some of the cell types that are present in the cerebral cortex, but of course we still know very little about what are the cell types in the brainstem or in the thalamus. And even uh, once we know many of the cell types, it has been really challenging to understand how they reach their final position because in development is essentially the rule uh, rather than the exception that cells reside not in the place in which they're born, but very often have to move uh, many, many centi centimeters for months and months to find, find their final position. And of course, after that, they have to project very often for meters to find their final uh, uh, partners and form synapses. And ultimately, the circuits are refined for many, many years postnatally. So as you can imagine, uh, uh, understanding most of these processes, which are at inaccessible stages of development, has precluded our understanding of psychiatric disorders. So what we have been trying to do in the lab is try to model many of these aspects, um, of course, not in total, but rather in isolation. Um, and so what I would actually like to do today is show you how we've been going from understanding some of the early stages of cell specification uh, and mapping uh, genes onto this specific processes all the way to with a new platform that I want to show you today start to understand how uh, plasticity and even behavioral readouts uh, can be uh, obtained with the cells. And so of course the model that we use is, uh, is leveraging uh, three-dimensional self-organization and I'm sure uh, everybody's already familiar but in general uh, many of the uh, brain organoids or neural organoids leverage essentially mechanical forces, local proliferation, various gradients to differentiate some of the cells into parts of the nervous system. And there's been quite a lot of confusion about what is actually being derived in vitro and what to call what. So actually over the past year, and I'll show you this in a second, there's been quite a lot of effort into, and I'll skip this, there's been quite a lot of effort into trying to uh, 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 re-refine our naming system. And so I'm really glad that in the next few weeks we'll have a nomenclature paper as, a, as the neural organoid community uh, uh, that essentially defines some of the key terms that are being used, including defining some of the terms that should not be used. And so in general, the uh, uh, approach, the key term here is actually guidance. And so most of the neural organoids uh, are more or less guided. So some of them, for instance, are unguided, as some of the uh, early studies in organoids, and essentially those leverage self-organization and yield spectacular uh, cell diversity and other approaches, and uh, these are the ones that I'm going to talk primarily here today, is actually to try to guide uh, 
the cell fate in this organ is towards very specific regions, um, such as the spinal cord, the striatum, the cerebral cortex, and then once one wants to study some cell-cell interactions to put them together two by two, three by three, or more to form assembloids. And so again, the approach that we've been developing is primarily leveraging this guidance uh, at very early stages. It doesn't involve the embedding into extracellular matrices. It essentially just involves aggregating pluripotent stem cells and moving them to a low, to low attachment plate where they form these spherical structures and then essentially just spiking in various molecules. And this yields uh, 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 self-limiting spherical structures that reach about three to four millimeters in size. As you can see, that's like similar to the mouse brain at like mid-gestation. Um, and of course, then this can be maintained for very long periods of time. In fact, they can maintain to the extent that we know indefinitely. Now, they recapitulate when driven towards the dorsal forebrain, a lot of the cell diversity, including the presence of glutamatergic neurons and various subtypes of progenitors. And in fact, if guidance is used, uh, then in fact, the process can be quite reliable. And you can see here, like one of our first experiments where we've differentiated a dozen human IPS lines in close to 100 experiments, but we've now done this, we've now done this in over 150 lines. And if guidance is uh, uh, carefully uh, used and the lines are well characterized, this actually can hit very predictable stages despite the large cell diversity. And again, this cultures can be maintained for very long periods of time so that you can actually get both deep and superficial layer neurons. Then there is a switch to gliogenesis, especially after 150 days later. And if the right conditions are provided, you can even get oligodendrocytes, which some uh, evidence of uh, oligodendrogenesis. And in fact, one of the fundamental questions has been how far can we actually go in development? And I'm not going to speak too much about this, but we've been maintaining some of the longest cultures that have been uh, maintained to date, going beyond 800 days. And in a series of papers, we've actually shown that both at the transcriptional level, chromatin level, and epigenetic, there is a gentle switch that happens at around nine to 10 months, where some of the signatures actually transition from a fetal signature to a postnatal signature. And that actually includes canonical switches of receptors, such as, for instance, the NMDA receptor switch happens right at the time of birth in vitro. That does not mean that all features are recapitulated. And in fact, you'll see that there are some major limitations in recapitulating some of the, not necessarily the timing, but some of the features associated with that maturation. And we've used this uh, uh, relatively simple, straightforward regionalized system uh, to study uh, you know, both astrocyte development over the years, identify viruses, for instance, uh, with Viviana Gradinaro's group at Caltech uh, that infect very specific cell types, mapping, for instance, disease genes uh, onto specific uh, cell processes, try to understand the evolution by building fused human chim cells, and then building a number of disease models for both environmental uh, models such as hypoxic encephalopathy or classic genetic disorders such as 22Q11 deletion syndrome. But one of the challenges, again, with building regionalized brain organoids is that it's very difficult to study some of these complex cell-cell interactions between brain regions. And so to address this, we came up with a very simple approach a number of years ago where you essentially provide different cues in two different dishes so that you drive the differentiations into two different fates. And then at the right time, and that right time depends a little bit on the brain region, you essentially put them together to form an assembloid. And that actually turns out to be, we thought for a long time that it would be actually quite difficult to fuse them. And so we've, for years we've been planning how we'll do that fusion with various uh, engineering approaches, but it turns out it's actually very straightforward. You, you just put them at the bottom of an Eppendorf tube, and if you wait for about 24 hours, they will essentially fuse very simply because they're neuroepithelial cells. And the idea behind this is that you would, for instance, make a dorsal forebrain and you would make a ventral forebrain. All interneurons are born in the ventral forebrain in humans. And then when you would put them together, you would expect that interneurons will start to slowly uh, move uh, using uh, nucleokinetic uh, jumps and reach uh, the cerebral cortex. And to a large extent, this is exactly what you see, because when you fuse these two parts, and you can see one of the earliest examples that we've uh, gotten, you can make a ventral forebrain and have beautiful interneurons here. And then once you fuse it with the dorsal forebrain, uh, a large fraction of interneurons start to move towards the dorsal forebrain, and they do so in this peculiar uh, jumping behavior movement of the cells. And we've used it already to discover disease. But in order to uh, model circuit uh, formation, we've also introduced a few years ago assemblies that put together more brain regions and look at axon guidance. And I'm not gonna 
go into details of this, but you can, for instance, take the cerebral cortex, make a spinal cord hind brain organoid, and human muscle. And then when you put, for instance, uh, cortical with spinal cord, we've discovered that primarily deep layer neurons in the cortex will send projections, find motor neurons, which are about 10%, and then those motor neurons are the primar primary cells that would leave uh, the spinal cord and connect with a human skeletal muscle. And that uh, connection is, although it's relative, connectivity is relatively sparse, it's actually sufficient uh, to trigger muscle contraction. And so, for instance, you can see here that if you make such a large assembly, and by the way, they're relatively large, because uh, we were talking last night about like their size, they're about nine millimeters in size. So they, at that time, they were not even fitting in our field of view of imaging. So you have to believe me that there is actually a spinal cord organoid here and a cortex right here. And only the cortex has general dopsin, so it's blue light sensitive. Well, in this case, actually, it's like red light sensitive. And at, you'll see that at one point, the screen goes black and it says stim, and that's the moment when you deliver light onto the cortical side, and that essentially triggers muscle contraction. So that tells us that to a simple, minimalistic way, some of the circuits form without much instruction uh, from the outside. So how can we use some of these assembloids? And so we've been modeling a number of disorders, and by the way, there have been a, a, a number of assemblies that have been developed. Like we can now make more than a dozen human brain regions. And interestingly, in the last just a few years, there have been like bladder assemblies, cardiac assemblies, I think we've seen today, um, endometrial assemblies, and so on and so forth. But the question is, how can you use a system that is relatively complex to map disease genes? And so a few years ago, a very uh, courageous uh, postdoc in my lab, Shan Ling Meng, wanted to actually map uh, a, a large group of autism genes, I mean, as many neurodevelopmental genes as possible, onto this complicated process of neuronal generation and migration, which has been associated with autism for a very long time. And so essentially, we took most of the autism genes, high confidence and not that high confidence, as well as many of the neurodevelopmental genes that have been uh, uh, pinpointed to date. We overlapped that with expression in the ventral forebrain, and we ended up with about 425 genes associated with disease. And then Shanling built a CRISPR screen in a cell line that expresses uh, GFP under an enhancer specifically uh, present in uh, interneurons in the ventral forebrain. And then she ran essentially two screens, one for this all these 400 plus genes with 2,400 uh, guide RNAs, and uh, one was to try to see which of these genes impact interneuron generation. And then another screen in parallel, which was very difficult, to see how that impacts interneuron gen uh, uh, migration. Meaning that she's essentially made over 1,000 assembloids, let the cells migrate, and then manually dissected the two, and isolated single cells uh, to see which guides RNA were enriched or obviously non-enriched into the other side. And it turns out that this actually works quite well. So for instance, you can identify many of the genes that generate, that, that impact interneuron generation, some of them actually very well known before, such as FOXG1, but you can also take like new genes that were not generically uh, associated with interneuron generation, uh, knock them out separately, so you can see for instance here as MADD4 or Syncrep, uh, and then if you generate now subpallium or ventral forebrain uh, organoids, you can see not only that their size is actually affected, so they're much smaller, but actually the proportion of interneurons in each of them is uh, reduced. And in fact, we think that in many of these cases there is a switch in the ventral fate in these organoids. Now, the most challenging was can we actually identify all the autism genes that impact interneuron migration? And again, the screen showed that you can actually, with quite some high levels of robustness, identify them. And together, by the way, about 10% uh, of the genes that we've, uh, that we've screened were impacting either generation or migration, which is not a high number, but it's still uh, a, a significant proportion. And so you can see, for instance, two of these genes that we've identified, and one in particular was actually quite puzzling, and I'll get back to it. But if you, again, if you knock them out now separately, either uh, uh, this or Luna part, and then you look in assembloids, you can actually see that they, oh, it's interesting, you can actually see the bars here. But you can actually see that they don't affect the generation of interneurons, but actually they will affect the proportion of interneurons that move onto the other side. And in fact, you can take one of these genes, uh, which is called Luna Park, and causes a very severe, severe encephalopathy, an epileptic encephalopathy in children. And then if you knock it out, you can see this beautiful defect where cells essentially fail 
to undergo these migratory jumps. So their jumps are normal in length, but actually they jump less often. And it turns out that this gene is important for maintaining the ER structure, uh, which was also surprising because the ER has not been generally associated with internal migration. So to further uh, uh, you know, uh, study this, we've actually uh, used a cell line that is a reporter cell line for the ER and just looked at the ER during internal migration, only to discover, quite surprisingly, that just before the nucleokinetic jump, all of the, or the majority of the ER moves right in front of the nucleus. Um, and that happens every three hours as the cells undergo this jump. And so you can see it here a little bit quantified um, over time, but you can uh, hopefully appreciate that right before every single nuclear jump, which is shown here in black, the ER condensates essentially right in front of the nucleus. So we essentially believe, and I'm not showing you the data, that in this case, Luna Park, which is a structural ER protein, is essentially impairing this ability of the ER to move right in front of the nucleus and impairs those migratory steps. But I think overall, this speaks to the fact that you can take an assembly, a relatively complex assembly approach, which takes hundreds of days to build, and then screen most of the autism genes to identify some genes that specifically impact that process, in this case, obviously, with relevant for disease because this causes a severe encephalopathy in these patients. And that's sort of like the quantification. But one of the major questions in which I actually want to spend the second half of my talk is how do we go about modeling later stages of maturation? I mean, I think we're all, and there's been a lot of discussion yesterday as well as today, as to how do we reach later stages of development and to what extent we can actually accelerate development in addition. I think there's no place where this is more prominent than in human development, where many of these processes take up to the second decade. I mean, myelination takes actually up to the third decade, according to many. And then interneurons, for instance, migrate up to the second year of life postnatally, and so on and so forth. And I think, it's, <laughs> uh, it, I think it, this is more clear. Uh, perhaps it will become more clear when I show you this image. This is um, a human stem cell-derived cortical neurons uh, maintained for about 250 days in a dish. This is as large as it can grow. Now, in comparison, this is a early postnatal, so early postnatal, first year of life, human neuron from uh, a cortical slice. I mean, certainly, there are probably another 30, 40 days that we could give this neuron in a dish. But certainly, there's no way it's going to catch up on that size. And in fact, it's not just the size. It's, for me as a neuroscientist, it's the electrophysiological properties of the cells. The resting member potential of the cell sits somewhere at around minus 50, where, of course, the resting member potential of most pyramidal cells is minus 70 and minus 75. So that precludes, to a large extent, what type of experiments you can do and what type of phenotypes you can discover. And so to address some of these issues, over the past six years, we've been developing a new platform that tries to leverage the in vivo environment in an effort to both try to accelerate this maturation but also, as you will see in the last part, to try to obtain behavioral readouts for some of the cells. And so this essentially involves transplantation of human cells. And I'll tell you what is unique about this transplantation, because there have been, obviously, many efforts of transplanting human neurons. What is unique about this are at least two aspects. First of all, is that, as you will see, we transplant intact self-organizing organoids, number one. And number two, we put them in a specific part of the cerebral cortex at very early stages of development. In fact, we put them in before the closure of the critical periods of some of these regions. And that turned out to be key. And so essentially, the experiments go something like this. You grow some of these cortical organoids in a dish. They advance to some early stages of maturation, sort of like the first kind of like trimester. And then you take them and transplant them into immunocompromised rats. And we place them right into the somatosensory cortex of the rat with, by just gently uh, displacing the surrounding cerebral cortex, and we leave them there. And when you come back and you look a few months later, as you will see, the graft actually can grow quite large. And in fact, we've discovered initially almost by chance that you can see the graft really well on an MRI for reasons that are still like elusive, but it turns out that probably either the contrast with myelination or some other aspect. But that turned out actually to be gold because it allowed us to go beyond just anecdotic studies 
And so just in this experiment for validating the platform, we've used close to 100 transplantation experiments in more than a dozen human iPS lines to make sure that we can actually reproducibly create a unit of human cortex into that part of the rat cortex. And again, it turns out that you know, this is reproducible across multiple lines, but then if you wait for four or five months, you can actually grow reproducibly about a third of the human rat to be human. And it's always on one side, and it's always in the somatosensory cortex. And just to remind you, the somatosensory cortex of the rat is the part of the rat cortex that receives input from the contralateral whiskers. And again, that growth is primarily in, in month four and five, so it accelerates. And the reason why you get this, and by the way, this is how the graph looks if you want to see it by GFP. So I hope you can appreciate the fact that the graph is relatively large. It's about 35% on average. And it is essentially creating a unit of cortex that goes from the ventricle to the pia. Again, the reason behind that was also because we wanted it to be in a place where you could easily access it for various assays that I'll show you in a few minutes. The reason the graph grows so large is because it becomes vascularized very quickly. So you can see, for instance, here rat blood vessels that grow into it. Microglia also move in from the rat, but there are few other cells from the rat that move in. So 99% of the graph is essentially human, but you can see these beautiful blood vessels of rat origin and human cells. Here, for instance, you can see a beautiful human astrocyte that starts to wrap around the blood vessels here and here in an effort probably to form some sort of like blood brain barrier. Not that, that we have evidence for that, but probably in an effort to like connect similarly to it would happen in vivo. And so the question is, how does cell identity look in transplanted organoids? And the reason is because obviously when the organoid grows relatively large, and you can see here another graph at about eight weeks, uh, there's very little, as you can see, very little border. So you can't really tell where the graph starts or where the human uh, or, or the rat cell starts. So what we essentially did is we purified uh, single cells from uh, the graph, but also from cortical organoids that have been maintained in parallel from essentially the same line, same batch of differentiations. And essentially, this revealed something quite surprising. I mean, although in vitro we have previously seen, we and many others have seen layer specific markers that are expressed, cortical layer specific markers that are expressed, we've never truly seen a separation of cortical layers uh, at the transcriptional level. But as you can see here, these are all the glutamatergic cells on the side. There are very clear, distinguishable clusters. When you take the Allen Institute layer-specific markers and tr label transfer them, you can actually see that some of these are actually layer 6b. These ones are layer 6. Uh, these ones are upper layer neurons, which is something that we've never really seen in vitro. And just to contrast, again, many of those markers are present, but that separation is not that clear. And so the next question was, well, do these cortical organoids integrate? And so in order to ask that question, we essentially injected rabies virus into the organoid before transplantation and then looked uh, brain-wide to see what cells are actually lighting up. And it turns out that the human graph receives input from only two sources. Uh, one is the surrounding cortex, so just the surrounding rat cortex just sends projections in laterally, and the other one is the ipsilateral thalamus. And so indeed, when you look on cross-sections, you can see the human graph here, you can see the thalamus, and then terminals that are coming from the thalamus, so thalamocortical projections that are going in. Again, just to remind you, the transplantation are done before the closure of the critical period of thalamocortical projections. And if you do it after, you do not get this level of integration, which I think is really important. And you can even get slices, and then look in slices and stimulate, for instance, the internal capsule and obtain beautiful responses from human neurons that are glutamate receptor mediated. And so, of course, the question is now that we see a lot of the cell diversity of the cortex, um, the cells seem to be connected to the thalamus, uh, is there any activity that can be monitored in this graph? So to do this, we actually put GCAMP or a calcium indicator inside the human graph before transplantation, and then a few months later, we open the skull of the rat and image in an anesthetized rat the activity of cells. And you get something like this, this beautiful sparkling activity of human neurons in vivo. And of course, you can characterize the activity of this, uh, you know, the patterns of the spontaneous activity. You can also use extracellular recordings. But the question was, 
because this pathway is, again, in the, you know, the, the, this uh, organoid sits into this pathway that uh, receives input from the whiskers. Just to remind one more time, the contralateral whisker that sends projections to the thalamus uh, on the opposite side, the question was, would you be able to actually puff air on the whiskers and read activity in human cells? And the answer is, uh, is yes, you can actually do that. And if you essentially deflect the control whiskers of the rat and look at the activity, you see these beautiful responses of human cells. And you can see here quantified that the responses are aligned one second after the stimulation. And you can even do the same experiment with extracellular recording, so an independent experiment where you stimulate, and I hope you can see here, beautiful responses after the control whisker stimulation. So this tells us that we can obtain human neurons that receive physiological input, and perhaps that is responsible for a lot of the changes that underlie that separation of layers as well. And indeed, gene expression indicated that most of the genes that are differentially expressed between in vivo and in vitro cultures are actually activity-dependent genes. And more surprisingly, and I think this was the biggest surprise of the study, was that when we started to actually look at the morphology of the cells, just to remind you, this is how human cortical neurons look in vitro at about 250 days. When you now reconstruct human neurons from the same batch, same differentiation and same line that were grown for 250 days in vivo, then you get neurons that look like this. And so that tells us that the in vivo environment provides critical information that remains still unknown. We think that is primarily activity dependent that underlies this dramatic growth. And this can actually be quantified over time, and it can actually be uh, also, uh, it's also accompanied by changing in the resting member potential. So actually the resting member potential of the cells is now closer to minus 75. That is actually very close to the resting member potential of human neurons that we've obtained from excised tissue from children that had to undergo surgery uh, in parallel. And you can see them here quantified. So quite closely, about 80% of the size of a human neuron at about like three years of age. And very importantly, you can actually transplant cells from patients. And although we don't see differences in this case from this specific disease that is caused by a mutation in activity-dependent gene, you don't see differences in vitro. Once you transplant, you can actually detect differences in an in vivo environment. So I think this highlights the fact that um, in vitro models certainly allow us to track some of the timing and allow us to discover some levels of phenotype but they're gonna be, as we move forward for some of the circuit level phenotypes, uh, uh, some of these transplantation platforms will be important to, uh, uh, to highlight. And in the last minute, because I have one more minute, I wanna show you the last uh, uh, experiment that we've been doing, which has been actually uh, you know, bothering us for a while to like, actually systematically do, which was when we looked at projections from the human graft, we very quickly realized that while the human graph receives input primarily from the thalamus, it actually sends projections pretty much all over the central nervous system. And so the question was, if these neurons project all throughout the nervous system, could it be that human neurons would be able to participate to the rat behavior and therefore get a human a readout, a behavior readout for human neurons? And so to do this, we did the following experiment. We, take, we, we took human uh, organoids, cortical organoids, and we infected them with the light-sensitive channel rhodopsin, right? So that makes the cells sensitive to blue light. And then we transplanted them, them into the rats exactly as you have seen before. We let them grow for about 150 days. The human graft grows. But then we take the rats, so it just like grows up to that side, and then we put a fiber uh, implantation right on top of it that is capable of delivering uh, light, and then we place them in a conditioning, uh, in a rat conditioning uh, uh, chamber, where actually we stimulate either with blue light or with red light as we are delivered reward, in this, in this case water. And over 14 days or so, we train the rats to associate delivery of water with stimulation with blue light of human cells. And indeed, it turns out that it works really well because the cell, this, this rats don't, cannot distinguish in the first day or so, but by the day 14, they actually can really well distinguish between blue light and red light. So that in the end, you can do this experiment after day 15, where you actually put the rats 
and it is sufficient to just deliver blue light, and you see like you deliver red light and nothing really happens, so that does not stimulate human cells. But then you deliver blue light, and then rats in 95% of the, train, the, the uh, uh, times will actually go and drink water. And so that tells us that it is possible to actually integrate the cells into the rat cortex. And now just imagine having patient cells on one side and having control cells onto the other side and trying to uh, read essentially behavioral changes uh, following this transplantation. And, and with this, I would like to uh, finish, and I hope I've convinced you that this is an exciting time for human neurobiology as well, as we are gaining access to more and more of this inaccessible aspect of human brain uh, development. And uh, this is my group, and I don't think I had the, uh, you know, I only measured, I think, Shan Ling, which is somewhere here for her work, but Omer Revach, uh, Kevin Kelly, um, and Felicity Gore deserve all the credit for the study that I've shown you on transplantation. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank you. And I'm not sure whether it's time for questions, but. Thank you. I think we We may have time for one or two burning questions. Yep, over there. Hi. Really great talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was curious, how does the rat brain adapt to this graft? So what is lost, what is reduced, what yeah. How does it behave? So we've done extensive characterization, as you can imagine, uh, for the rat um, over time. Uh, rats adapt really well to this. I mean, mm -hmm. people have actually been transplanting tumors that grow much larger than this in rats. Um, we've actually both monitored them cognitively and found no differences between rats that were transplanted and non-transplanted. We were afraid that obviously they would be cognitively impaired or they wouldn't be able, they're not affected. Um, and our biggest fear was actually because we put a large, you know, bolus of human excitatory cells, right? We put about, you know, probably two to three million human neurons that they would actually become, they would develop seizures, they would become epileptic. And so we've both monitored their behavior, but we've actually done EEG for hours into the rat, and there has been no evidence of seizures. Mm -hmm. We will take one question for the live stream. Kathleen. Thanks, so I've got a couple of questions from the live stream, but I'll just ask one of them, which is, um, is there any way of, of removing and then characterizing the organoid after it's been integrated? So can you take it out? Can yeah. you analyze it in any way? And if you can, does it actually continue to grow and develop? Well, I mean, we haven't grown it after transplantation. Um, all the single cell characterization has been in cells that have been transplanted and then perform like nuclear seq on those. So you can do that. Um, remember, the graft is vascularized. So just like taking it from an in vivo environment and suddenly putting it in vitro poses some challenges. But one can actually grow slices. And I can imagine you could grow it afterwards for a while. But we haven't done that. You can obviously do slice record. I mean, all the patch clamping has been done in slices. So essentially, you can uh, remove the graft completely, uh, slice it, do patch clamping for a few days, or do single cells. But we haven't maintained it, for instance, for weeks or months. OK, we take the last question from the audience. My question was actually really similar to that. So I was just curious as to whether or not, if you could resect this implant and actually grow them in culture, would they retain the adult phenotype? Because that would be really incredible for regenerative purposes. That's a great point. I mean, yeah. there's certainly loose vascularization, which I think will pose some limitations. On the other hand, you know, we can also grow adult, well, adult, postnatal cortical tissue for weeks. Um, you know, in the absence of vascularization. I mean, it's a little bit more challenging. And of course, you always have to use um, serum of sorts, which activates astrocytes, which I think poses some challenges. But I assume you would be able to keep them for weeks. Mm -hmm. That That's was the case. Nice. And I, I assume they wouldn't reverse. I mean, my expectation would be that they would not reverse. I mean, once they went on that path and they became, you know, layer six cortical pyramidal neurons, the worst thing that can happen is they can die because they don't have the input or the output but I don't think they would reverse back to a less differentiated state. Yeah. That may be one way to study aging degeneration. <laughs> Perhaps, I mean, I, I think timing is still conserved. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's one aspect that I think is very important to keep in mind. I mean, although we transplant them into the rats, 
the timing for development for humans is not accelerated. Mm -hmm. So they'll still make cortical layers at pretty much the same pace as they would in vivo. Mm -hmm. So you still need 150 days to 200 days to make most of the cortical neurons. The astrogenesis switch also happens at the right time. Mm -hmm. So we're not accelerating. Mm -hmm. I think the timing is well conserved whether it's in vivo or in vitro. Mm -hmm. It's just that there are additional features Okay. that you're able to sort of like enable because of the in vivo environment. Right, so, and, so the red environment would not accelerate. So I, I don't think they're like, for instance, adult. I think they're like, at the stage probably, we've been maintaining them for 500 days or so, so probably they would be like early postnatal. Okay, thank you. Thank you.